Just a couple housekeeping notes, just about scheduling. So, I um, hope you've learned a lot over Advent, as we are now in Advent, preparing for Advent. If you notice on the calendar for December, this is our only alive event for the month. So in December, we just have this level one course. There are no level two courses, but if your small group wants to get together to celebrate Christmas together, great. Uh, but I just figured there's so much happening in uh, December. Many people may not find time to be able to do a level two, and we're not having a level three as well either, just because there's so much happening. So in December is just this level one class. In uh, January on Epiphany, which is January the 6th, which is a Saturday, we have a mass for the Feast of the Epiphany on Saturday night at 5 o'clock. The choir is going to be with us this year. That is a whole parish game night and potluck, which will be a lot of fun. And then we pick back up with a live on Sunday for the baptism of the Lord. And we'll have our next Alive Level 1 class. So there's really no Level 2 or Level 3 courses this whole month just because of the craziness of December. And so we have tonight to talk about Christmas Tide. So let's begin on page 1 with this month's collect, which is from the second Sunday after Christmas, but it's some powerful language. Let's pray this prayer together, and then we'll launch from there. All right? The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. O God, who wonderfully created, and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him, who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. All right, to get things started is a table discussion. You can have at your table for about the next five minutes. This is for everyone. Little ones, teens, older saints, everyone at your table. Go to your hymnals, and you're going to find two really famous Christmas hymns. One is hymn number 83, which is the barn burner for Christmas, O Come All Ye Faithful. And then hymn number 87, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Take a look at that and just take a look at words and phrases or theological themes that you see in the lyrics of both of those famous, famous Christmas hymns. And then we'll have about, oh, I don't know, five or ten minutes We'll gather back, we're going to put them all on the board, and then we're going to split up, and then we'll launch into some theology. So take some time, look at those two hymns, and look at phrases or words that may jump out at you, especially given everything we learned during Advent. So go on ahead. All right, let's gather together, let's gather back. We're going to tackle O Come All Ye Faithful first, so if you go to 83 in your hymnals, Shout out some words or phrases that kind of jumped out to you just looking at the lyrics of O Come All Ye Faithful. What? Come. Come. Low. Oh, you stole that from my sermon today. <laughs> Joyful. Now in flesh appearing. Citizens of heaven. Citizens of above? King. king. Did you notice how many times in those two hymns the word king was used? Yeah, huh, right? Here's that kingship stuff. Christ the king really sets up the whole feast of the incarnation. Well, what? Someone over here. Lord? He just took a guess. <laughs> That's good formation. Light from light. Notice that um, whole second verse. The beginning of the second verse is really from the creed. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Look, we're even taking it begotten, not made. Begotten of the Father. A lot of the creed is embedded in O Come All Ye Faithful. Choir. Triumph. Triumph. Come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Triumph over what? That's uh, later in the class. What else? God? Yeah, God, yeah. 
Don't just guess. You have to look into him. But I like your thoughts. A door. A door. Veiled in flesh. I know that's hark the herald, but if you notice, the word in flesh is in both hymns. In flesh. Which is really what the word incarnation means. Incarnatus. In flesh. 83. Hymn 83. Word of the Father. Boy, that's a big one. Word of the Father. Okay. Son. We're still on, oh, come all ye faithful. Shepherds. Shepherds. Citizens. It's number two for citizens there. All right. Born in the manger. Poor. Poor and in a manger. Woo. Behold. Hello? Behold. All right, let's go to Hark the Herald. Go to Hark the Herald. Son of Righteousness, 87. S-U-N. Son of Righteousness, S-U-N. If you notice, we have S-O-N and S-U-N. Prince of Peace. Notice that royal language again. Here's Prince, King, Prince of Peace. Prince, Prince of Peace comes from the prophecies Isaiah. Joyful all ye nations rise. Here's joyful again. Newborn king. Here's the word king again. <laughs> Christ. Peace on earth. Emmanuel. Reconciled. Mercy. Nations rise. Healing. Woo. Righteousness. Hark. Proclaim. I'm going to run out of board space. I'll use the other side. It's a lot of, it's a lot of theology up there. We're going to unpack both of these through all kinds of theology that we're going to tackle, um, found on the bottom of page one. But before we get to that, if we have any kids under, up into third grade who want to go with Kimmy, you're going to go into the sacristy. I think some of them may be in the back room. So if you have any little ones who want to go with Kimmy, great. And then teenagers are going to head over to um, the, my cross from my office, or any anybody can go across from my office with David and he will be doing some cool things with you all in the other room cool St. Nicholas this is your week what? feast of St. Nicholas is Wednesday yeah it is which is why I'm drinking out of the skull of St. Nicholas all right Let's do some deep theology tonight. This kind of really spins for my sermon this morning. If you haven't watched it, I would take a look at that sermon. The Holy Spirit was, I was sweating up here. You know, when the Spirit comes at heart, it's, all right. But just as much as we get Advent wrong, sometimes we get Christmas wrong. And it's based off of the same principle. Because all of this leads to what you see on the bottom of page one. This is now known as the season of the Incarnation. That's the power and the deep mystery that the church is preparing for and celebrating. One of my favorites, and by the way, these are some of the books that I mentioned in the back of this. This is Dom uh, Prosper Geringer. He's a Benedictine. You'll notice a lot of these books are Benedictine. He wrote a multi-volume series on the liturgical year. This comes from Christmas Book 1, out of Christmas Book 1 and 2. But let's dive into, if you notice, I will quote gospel readings that you're going to hear during Christmas tide. 
And the most famous one that we hear embedded all over it, and especially in O Come All Ye Faithful, is John chapter 1, 14, that beautiful prologue of John. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Prosper Garanger, the Word of God, who is begotten before the day star, begotten, not made, one of being with the Father, is now born in time. A child is God. Things divine are commingled with those that are human. And the sublime, the ineffable antithesis expressed by the loved disciple in those words of his gospel, the Word was made flesh, is repeated a thousand different times in thousands of different ways, all in the prayers of the church. And rightly, for it is admirably embodies that whole of the great portent which unites in one person the nature of humanity and the splendor of God. One of the greatest mysteries that we will celebrate when we reach Christmas is that the Word became flesh. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who spoke all through the Old Testament. I don't, that freaked people out when I told them the first time that. The Word of the Father who speaks. And if you notice all through the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to blank. Who spoke from the burning bush to Moses? It was the second person of the Trinity. That person of the Trinity, the word of the Father, the word through whom all things were made, took flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is fully God and fully human, taking everything of our human nature to ourself. Yes, that's cool. <laughs> In fact, all those old, old antiphons that we talked about, one of the second one is O Adonai, who Moses spoke, in, who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. The early church has always seen all of those speakings in the Old Testament as the second person of the Trinity who became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the word of the Father through whom all things were made, says the Gospel of John. Right? It's that person of the Trinity who comes among us. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Jesus is fully God and fully human. And that's the mystery that we celebrate at Christmas time. The nativity story, and we're going to see this, all of that beautiful piety around being born in a manger, you know, the ox and the ass at the manger, uh, the shepherds, all of that is how that all happened. But what the church really gets at as we dive into Christmas time is that powerful mystery that Jesus took flesh. And for us to even call him Jesus, the second person of the Trinity came down to dwell among us, which we call the mystery of the incarnation. That is really what Christmas is all about, that God became one of us. Go to the top of page two. This is the creed from the Council of Chalcedon which you will find in the Book of Common Prayer and the historical documents in the back on page 864, which kind of unpacks what I just said in way farther language. Therefore, following the Holy Fathers, meaning the apostles and the early bishops, we all with one accord, and by the way, this was written in 451, we all with one accord teach all to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead, and complete in manhood, truly God, and truly human, existing also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance, homoousios, one being, as we say in our modern words, with the Father as regards to his Godhead, and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his humanity, his manhood. Like us in all respects, apart from sin, as regards his Godhead, begotten of the Father before all ages, but yet as regards his manhood, begotten for us and for our salvation of Mary, the Virgin, the Theotokos. Yes, the word Theotokos is found in the Book of Common Prayer, a title for Mary that we say Mother of God, but Theotokos literally means in Greek, the God-bearer. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, 
Ooh, we're getting to heavy theology. The distinction of natures being in no way annulled by the union, but rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person and one subsistence. Not as parted or separated into two persons, but one and the same God and the only begotten God, the Word, Lord Jesus Christ. Even as the prophets from earliest times spoke of Him. And our Lord Jesus Christ Himself taught us, and the creed of the fathers has handed down to us. Jesus Christ fully God, and now fully human. And that's the power of the incarnation. We get a little fired up about that, right? It's the bedrock of our faith. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Why did he take on flesh? Why? Second powerful thing of Christmas. At Christmas, we have an encounter with God. The first letter of St. John says, what we have seen with our eyes. As I talked about today in the sermon, God no longer limits himself to an invisible presence in a place where he manifests, such as the Theophanies on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. He now comes to dwell among us in flesh, in our human nature. And this is why John says what John says. We declare to you what was from the beginning. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, lo, behold, what we have seen, what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life, Jesus Christ, was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and declared to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Why did the Word become flesh? First and foremost, God wanted to be with us. He wanted us to hear Him, to see Him, to touch Him. The God who was invisible and just manifested in various ways, through the burning bush, for example, now comes to us in full human nature. That is the major distinction with Christianity. God becomes visible, in flesh, appearing. Number three, Christmas begins our redemption. If you notice in all of those hymns, there's all kinds of verbiage about being saved and being redeemed. If you notice in the sermon today, right? O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That's an act of redemption. Easter and Christmas are two sides of the same coin. Christmas is the beginning of our redemption. The Word became flesh. Why? Not only to be seen, but to make us partakers of the nature of God. We heard that in 2 Peter. For this is why the Word became human, and the Son of God became the Son of Man. So that humanity, by entering into communion with the Word, and thus receiving divine adoption, might become a son or daughter of God. That's St. Irenaeus, writing back in 175, 185. The Word, God, became human so that humans can become like God. He came for us to share in our, in His life. And how did He do that? By setting us free and redeeming us. Christmas is the beginning of our salvation. Our redemption from sin and death would have been impossible if Christ had not become fully human and the head of the human race, the new Adam, and the counterweight to the sin of the old Adam, while at the same time being fully God. Gregory of Nazianzus in his Epistle 101 in 300, early 300s, what has not been assumed has not been healed. And what is united to his divinity, that is saved. Christ took on the fullness of our flesh with all of its weaknesses, with all of its temptations, did not sin, but everything that Christ assumed, he healed in us. That's the power of the incarnation as well, too. Christmas is not just about the story of the birth of Jesus in the manger at Bethlehem. I know that's shocking. Right? Let's go back to Adrian Nocent. He's another Benedictine. Clearly, I love Benedictines. But they know the best about liturgy. Jesuits know the best about everything. Benedictines know the best about liturgy, along with the Norbertines. 
This is his book, The Liturgical Year, which is pretty awesome. The introduction of the creche, and who, by the way, established the setting up of a nativity scene? We talked about this in October. Bum, bum, bum. This is your quiz. Hint, hint, he was an Italian. The first person to make a nativity set, Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi. In the 1300s, by the way, there's been images of the nativity, but the first to set up a nativity scene as we know it today, or a creche, is St. Francis. The introduction of that and all the Christmas folklore has been a good thing. But neither can nor should be simply rejected. We must admit, however, that the injection of these elements, especially at a time when both the liturgy and the knowledge of Scripture were in decline, that's why Francis did the nativity set. People weren't that very literate, so let's just show this in a scene. Has turned Christmas for many into the feast of tender pity. Oh, look how cute that is, little baby Jesus. In our modern context, we have a lot of children's Christmas pageants. I know a lot of our Episcopal churches across the country, that primary, which really, when you think about it, when people come to church like twice a year, Christmas and Easter, and their one Eucharist is literally a children's pageant, which in nature isn't bad because it's teaching little kids. But when that becomes the only thing we talk about at Christmas, that becomes problematic. Why? The mistake is to have focused the celebration too much on the birth in Bethlehem and have turned the object of the feast into just a moving story. His birth at Bethlehem is rather the occasion than the object of the feast. The object, what we really celebrate, is the total mystery of our redemption an already announced Paschal mystery that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So hear me, I'm not saying that all of that nativity stuff, because the nativity has a lot to teach us about how the King came among us in flesh and shocking realities that God truly became flesh among us, which is a powerful thing. And you would assume that this mighty king and God himself, when he would come in human nature, would come in a mansion, would come with the whole thing. But how did he come? He came in a manger and was placed in a feeding trough where animals go to the bathroom. He was placed in a lowly stable, which, by the way, wasn't out in the country and by himself. There was no room for them in the Cataluma. You know this story. There was no room in the Cataluma, says Luke. Cataluma is the same words for the place of the upper room where Jesus had the Last Supper. It was the guest room. There was no room in the guest room. Why was there no room in the guest room? Well, because the whole family was there from the census. And where was the best place for a woman to have a baby? Not around that. And who knows? Aunt Ruth and Uncle Jebediah may not have liked her. Yeah, right, Joseph. An angel showed up and she has a baby. You believe that? You ain't going to be in here. So where did she go? Downstairs in the basement, which was a carved cave where they kept their animals. And there was normally a hole in that that she kept the house warm. God comes right into the middle of our family dysfunction. There's the message. When he appears, he doesn't appear to the royalty. His birth is not announced to the royalty. It's announced to the shepherds who are considered the outcasts of Bethlehem. Outcasts by the people who thought they were robbers. Outcasts by the religious stories, the leaders because they were unclean. That's who Jesus announces his birth to first. The shepherds. So yes, we can learn a lot from the story of the nativity. But when it just becomes about a moving story, we forget the whole point that God became flesh to dwell among us, to take on our humanity so that we can be with him forever in heaven. It's the first act of our redemption. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. And that's what you hear embedded throughout all of those hymns. Not only did the word become flesh that we have seen him, that he begins our redemption, but he is now with us. In the sacraments. As John said, what we touch with our hands. I love this. Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome, writing in the 400s, wrote numerous Christmas sermons. If you want something to do during Advent, search Leo the Great Christmas sermons. There's a slew of them. They are beautifully rich and thick. And several times in a lot of his sermons, he uses the phrase repeatedly, the sacrament of the day of Christ's birth, or the sacrament of the Lord's birth. 
He writes that the words of the Gospels and the words of the prophets teach us to think of the Lord's birth wherein the Word became flesh, not as a past event, which we recall, but as a present reality upon which we gaze. Christmas renders present the mystery of our redemption. In celebrating Christmas, we now, now, just as Advent is about now and His coming arrival now, we experience the Word made flesh now who brings about our salvation through the sacraments. How could there be a real contact with God if the Incarnation had not occurred? If we can now know and touch God, it's because the Word became incarnate. Our relationship is with this incarnate Christ whose glorified body is now present in the Eucharist. Although without being subject to the limitations of space and time. The Eucharistic presence that is so essential to the church's life is unintelligible without the presence of the glorified body of the risen Christ. And the incarnation thus involves our humanity. And it is our humanity that is now divinized, where the very life of God is poured into us. That's the power of Christmas. That's why I love the Midnight Mass at Christmas. Yes, we're recalling the moments where Christ dwelt among us, but literally, when you are here, you are spiritually not only catapulted to that event into that cave in Bethlehem, but you get to very have the encounter with God that the shepherds and all of those people gathered in a cave didn't have. Because not only do you get to hold him and you come to receive him, but his very life is poured within you. That's the power of Christmas. That's a lot more than kids with cotton balls glued to their face as shepherds and little bathrobes. Right? That's powerful stuff. All right, let's start to look at the liturgies. December 24th which is known as the Vigil of Christmas in the morning. If you pray morning prayer with us in the morning of December the 24th, by the way, join Advent morning prayer. Even if you can't pray it at 9 o'clock, those antiphons are so incredibly old and beautiful and tease out this theology, especially during the 12 days of Christmas. Christmas to Epiphany is beautiful. The Vigil of Christmas, which is the 24th of December, Couple of the antiphons. Tomorrow, the si- now notice all of the stuff I just told you. The power of the word becoming flesh, the first moments of our redemption, God wanting to be seen, and our encounter with him. Notice that all in the phraseology of the church. Tomorrow, the sin of the world will be taken away, and the savior of the world will reign over us. There's that kingship. Tomorrow, our salvation will be with us. Alleluia. Why are we shouting hallelujah so much at Christmas? It's the first moment of our redemption. And we shout it out powerfully when our redemption occurs at Easter time. This is the antiphon for the Benedictus, which comes from the Orthodox tradition. O Bethlehem, make ready to receive Christ. For the Word made flesh comes to dwell in you. Opening Eden to his people, bringing us back into the garden. Make ready, O manger, to behold the deep mystery. He who cannot be contained will be contained in you. That should give you goosebumps on the back of your neck. Alleluia. The reading, the third reading from one of the great fathers of the church, St. Augustine, is read on the vigil of Christmas. Awake, humankind. If you notice, here comes the bridge from Advent to Christmas. How many times did I say awake today in the gospel reading? A lot. Awake, humankind. For your sake, God has become a human. Awake, you who sleep. Rise up from the dead, joyful and triumphant over death. And Christ will enlighten you. I tell you again, for your sake, God became a human. You would have suffered eternal death had he not been born. See that first moments of the redemption? Neither would you have been freed ransom captive Israel from sinful flesh had he not taken on himself the likeness of sinful flesh. You would have suffered everlasting unhappiness had it not been for this mercy of his coming. You would have never had returned to life had he not shared your death. You would have had been lost if he had not been hastening to your aid. You would have perished had he had not come. 
Let us then joyfully celebrate the coming of our salvation and redemption. Let us celebrate the festive day on which He who is the great and eternal day, the Son of Justice, came from the great and endless day of eternity into our own short day of time. hoo Right? By the way, customs on Christmas, the vigil of Christmas. Vigils were always days of fasting. They were always days of fasting, which is why us Italians always had the Feast of the Seven Fishes on the vigil of Christmas. Why? Because you didn't eat meat on a vigil. It was days of fasting. And so you ate fish. But it's such a joyful time of fasting that we were like, let's do seven. Seven for the sacraments. Why seven for the sacraments? Because the incarnation opens to us the sacraments. So seven different types of fish. Tuna sauce with spaghetti, bacala, schmelz. That's straight from, that's what heaven's going to smell like on Christmas, just letting you all know. So if you don't like that smell, get to learn. Get to learn. I can just see the Blessed Mother firing up schmelz in heaven on Christmas Eve. And then the liturgy of Christmas opens up. I want you to open up your Book of Common Prayer to the collects for Christmas, which are found, please hold, which are found on page 212 to 213 in your Book of Common Prayer, but because I am so nice, I type them out for you. There are three different prayers the church says on Christmas And I want you to take a look at your tables. Everything that I just talked about, everything that I just mentioned, I want you to see. look at these collects and put those glasses on and see if what themes do you see that are based on the foundations of the liturgy that we just read. So take a look at all three of those collects and then we're going to unpack them. So take a look, about five minutes, we'll do that, five or ten minutes, and then we'll come back. All right, let's slowly unpack all these. First of all, the question, why three? Why three? Three different collects for Christmas. The early Christians in Jerusalem, and we know about this from, I love to call her the traveling nun, Ageria. She was a woman from, she was a nun from Spain who travels over to the Holy Land. She visits Christians for over a year and a half, goes to a lot of the liturgies, and she writes them down. It's called The Travels of Egeria, or The Pilgrimages of Egeria, written in the mid-300s. It's beautiful because when you look at some of those liturgies that she records, it's very similar to what we do today. But the early Christians in Jerusalem celebrated the birth of Christ and the nativity of Christ in a threefold liturgy, Act 1, 2, and 3, right? They gathered at the... By the way, the, does anyone know where the first Christian church was? It's the church in the nativity in Bethlehem that's built over the cave. For those of you who went on our Holy Land pilgrimage, we actually went there to the grotto, which is absolute movement. It's been there since the early 300s. Christians actually were going to that cave way earlier than that. St. Helen just built the church over it in the early 300s. So the Christians would actually process from Jerusalem. They would go to Bethlehem where they would have a, oh, guess what? Midnight celebration of the Lord's birth. We've been gathering in the middle of the night to celebrate Christ's birth almost since that event actually happened. So the midnight mass is a long, long time of history. And so they would go there to the cave of the nativity. And by the way, it just wasn't an hour. They would go all night because it was a true vigil and there would be the prophecies and the reading. And I love it. What the bishop would do is People would read from the scriptures and the bishop would be like, okay, I'm going to preach. And then he would just start talking. And then he'd go, okay, I'm done. Start reading again. And then they would read a different passage. And this would go and then they would sing psalms. And this would go all night. And then they would celebrate Eucharist towards the end of the night. That was the midnight celebration of the Eucharist. And then they would get up and they would walk back to Jerusalem as the dawn is rising. Because remember, Christmas and Easter are tied together. And so they would have an early morning Eucharist at the Church of the Resurrection, the Anastasis, they would have a Mass in the actual empty tomb of Jesus. That was in the morning on Christmas Day. Then they would come back later in the day and the Church celebrated Eucharist again. So there was always three Eucharists that were done on Christmas. The 
early church in Rome start following the practice in Jerusalem. So there was always a midnight Eucharistic celebration of the Lord's birth at the Church of St. Mary Major, which is a large basilica in Rome. Which, why? Because there's a piece of the manger in that church. And so the early Christians would gather there, remembering how the Christians in Jerusalem would gather at the Cave of the Nativity. And then they would process to the Church of St. Anastasia. Why? Because in Greek, that literally means resurrection. Because the Christians would process to the tomb of Jesus and have a mass at dawn. And so the nickname, the Shepherd's Mass, happened at dawn. Because that's when the shepherds arrived at the manger and worshipped the Christ child. And then there was always a mass during the day, again at the Church of St. Peter. So all of that is to say, why does the Book of Common Prayer have three collects? Because it goes all the way back to the ancient celebrations of Christians in Jerusalem and in Rome. All right? So let's look. And we at All Saints have three distinct Eucharists on Christmas, period. Christmas Eve, I will always pray the first collect. And there are special readings that go with that one. Look at the collect on top of page five. This is a bridge you can see between Advent and Christmas. Oh God, you make us glad by the yearly festival of the birth of your only Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who joyfully receive him, what's his title? Redeemer, ransom captive Israel. May with sure confidence behold him when he comes to be our judge. Notice the connection with the second coming. This collect was originally from the Sara Missal. The Sara Missal was the Latin liturgy that Thomas Cramner used to produce the Book of Common Prayer. And this was the Vigil Mass of Christmas that was actually done in the morning. And you can see the completion of Advent and the beginning of Christmas. The lectionary readings that are read at that 530 Eucharist are from Isaiah, the great prophet of Advent, the great prophecy, prophet of the coming Messiah. And just a line that will show you that connection with redemption. Say to daughter Zion, see your salvation comes. His reward is with him. His recompense before him. They shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Ransomed captive Israel. Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Paul's letter to Titus, for the grace of God has appeared. Why? Bringing salvation to all. And then we hear the nativity story for the first time, Luke 2. I'm going to intersperse customs in the midst of all this so you understand that too. And one of the customs that we have is actually to bless the nativity scene. This comes from the book of occasional services on page 35. Before the first liturgy of Christmas or at some other convenient time, a priest or bishop may bless the representation of the Lord's birth in the form of a creche. And at their entry into the church, the priest may make a station at the creche. If you notice, I carry in the baby Jesus. Why? Because the church says the figure of the Christ child may be carried in procession. It's a very ancient custom that actually is done in the church in the nativity in Bethlehem. Oh, great mystery. And notice, wonderful sacrament. That animals should see the newborn Lord lying in the manger. Blessed is the virgin whose womb was worthy to bear him, Christ the Lord. Alleluia. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Let us pray. O God, who in the incarnation of your Son has revealed to us the holiness of creation, be pleased to bless and hallow this image of his sacred birth. So, and then here's the reason why we have a nativity. So that those who gaze upon it may behold this mystery whereby humanity shares in your very nature that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Later in the night, we have what's called the... By the way, the word Christmas comes from Christ Mass. I love that, you know. Let's put Christ back in Christmas. And I'm always like, let's put Mass back in Christmas. That's what the word comes from. Christ Mass, which is the midnight celebration that your church has been doing almost from the very moment of Christ's birth. And then look at the collect for that one. And notice the mixing of light and darkness. Oh God, you have caused this holy night to shine with the brightness of the true light. The Son of Justice, risen with healing in his wings. Grant that we who have known the mystery of that light on earth, now, in the sacraments, now, may also enjoy him perfectly in heaven. 
This comes from the Gregorian Missal, from the original Mass, Midnight Mass at St. Mary Major. It's also in the Mass at Cockcrow in the Sarum Missal. By the way, this all comes from Marian Hatchett's book that I've mentioned to you before, the commentary on the American Prayer Book, which is really awesome. Look at the readings. The people who walked in darkness. Why? Because it's literally in the middle of the night. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Psalm 97, the light has sprung up for the righteous. Titus, when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, ransomed us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy and through the water of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Then we have the Gospel reading in Luke. Another great tradition is what's known as the Christmas Proclamation. The Christmas Proclamation goes back very, very early You'll hear me sing this right before we begin the Midnight Eucharist. And I love it. It narrows down salvation history right to that moment. When ages beyond number had run their course from the creation of the world, when God in the beginning created heaven and earth, formed humanity in his own likeness, when century upon century had passed since the Almighty set his bow in the clouds after the great flood as a sign of covenant and peace, in the 21st century, since Abraham, our father in faith, came out of Iraq, Ur of the Chaldees. In the 13th century, since the people of Israel were led by Moses in the exodus of Egypt. Around the 1,000th year of David was anointed king. In the 65th week of the prophecy of Daniel. In the 194th Olympiad. In the year 752 since the foundation of Rome. In the 42nd year of the reign of Caesar Octavian Augustus. The whole world being at peace. Jesus Christ, eternal God and Son of the Father, desiring to consecrate the world by His most loving presence, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and when nine months had passed since His conception, was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judah, and was made man. The, human, the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ according to the flesh. And you can read that beautiful line, the beautiful paragraph of, from St. Bernard, on the second sermon for Christmas Eve, which kind of talks about all of the stuff I did. But for the sake of time, I'm going to finish Christmas in 25 minutes. The Mass of Christmas Day. Now look at all this stuff. This is, I think, one of the most powerful collects. Almighty God, you have given your only begotten Son to take our nature upon him and to be born this day of a pure virgin. Grant that we who have been born again and made your children by adoption and grace may daily be renewed by your Holy Spirit. In his commentary, Massey Shepherd Jr. said of this collect, it is of all the prayer book collects the most notable for its theological content. For the whole of the doctrine of the Trinity and incarnation are encased in it. Specifically, the collect is woven around three themes. The birth of the only begotten Son and the substance of our human nature. And it is linked with the idea of our rebirth and baptism by the pure water and the Holy Spirit. Two, the eternal sonship of Christ is contrasted with our adoption as sons and daughters by the free grace of God. And three, the historic birth of our Lord at a specific time and place is spiritually renewed in the hearts of his followers daily. Isaiah once again leads the readings. Your sentinels lift up your voices, for in plain sight they see the Lord return to Zion. Sing to the Lord a new song. He has done marvelous deeds. Hebrews, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And then always on Christmas morning, the beautiful prologue of John is proclaimed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. You almost see the sunrise, right? So on Christmas Eve, it begins to dawn. At midnight, you really see it. And then at Christmas Day, it's in its full glory. The theology just kind of opens up in the three masses of Christmas. And it slowly expands. That's why every single Eucharist during Christmas is different. It's different because the church is offering us a different theology and showing us in beautiful ways, almost like the unfolding of a flower, the glory of the incarnation of the Son of God. How about them apples? Pretty awesome. And so why do we have all of these customs? Because any captive who is now set free is going to rejoice and feast 
and party and delight. And so all of these beautiful Christmas customs have spun out because of the deep celebration that God became one of us so that we could be like God. That's just day one of Christmas. That's why we have 12 days. <laughs> Jewish wedding feast in the first century went 8 to 12 days. It was not just one day. It takes us 12 days to slowly unpack the mystery and the power of the incarnation. That song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, came because we celebrate Christmas tide in the church from Christmas Day all the way to the Epiphany, which is when Christ is manifested to the nations. And so it takes 12 days, and so that's why each one of those days is what is mentioned in our liturgy. The big three that happened, bang, 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 right after Christmas Day, and we have liturgies for them every day, the 26th of December is the Feast of St. Stephen. The 27th of December is the Feast of John the Evangelist. The 28th of December is the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And we here at All Saints have liturgies on all of those days. Why? Because remember I told you Advent is about the parousia, the word adventus. I always move. Brandon gets... I'm sorry. I just keep moving and panning. I'm doing my thing. The um, Advent, adventus, is the coming of the king in the first century, especially in the Roman world. And so all kinds of people who were dignitaries escorted the king in. December 26th, 27th, and 28th is that retinue who helps escort the king in. St. Stephen, St. John, and the Holy Innocents. Who are these people and why? Notice Pius Parsh. Ah, oh, Pius Parsh, my other favorite liturgist. During Advent, we look forward to and yearn for the kingdom of God, and now at Christmas, we ought to solemnly witness and experience its presence. Joyfully and confidently, the liturgical texts tell of the Advent of Christ and His kingdom. This transition from expectation to fulfillment is wrought with subtle perfection. According to the liturgy, therefore, Christmas marks the establishment of God's kingdom upon earth. And this observation should help us evaluate the three feasts that follow the Nativity. Why? Book of Revelation again. Notice we've been talking about the Book of Revelation. And I looked, and there was with me a multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Notice the martyrs and the saints gathered around the throne of the Lamb. And so after Christmas, we have three days of different types of saints who were martyrs in their own right gathering around the Lamb. And the first and foremost is the first martyr, St. Stephen, the deacon. This comes from St. Fulgentius of Ruspe. How about that name? From 460 to 533, we're not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you to read the whole thing on the Feast of St. Stephen. You will read it during morning prayer. Yesterday we celebrated the birth and time of our eternal king. Today we celebrate the triumphant suffering of his soldier. Yesterday our king, clothed in his robe of flesh, left his place in the virgin's womb and graciously visited the world. Today his soldier leaves the tabernacle of his body and goes triumphantly to heaven. Our king, despite his exalted majesty, came in humanity for our sake, yet he did not come empty-handed. He brought his soldiers a great gift that not only enriched them, but also made them unconquerable in battle, for it was his gift of love, which was to bring humanity to share in his divinity. Whew. And so we have a hymn. Good King Wenceslas looked out. Right. It's the day after Christmas. The Feast of St. Stephen is the day after Christmas. And it all talks about how you take care of the poor. Why? Because we just saw our Lord born poor the day before. That's St. Stephen's Day. The 27th, the Feast of John the Apostle. Now, St. Stephen was a martyr in word and deed and will. John was not a martyr. He would have died for Jesus. In fact, he was poisoned. They poisoned his wine to try to kill him, but he didn't die. John is the only apostle, by the way, to die a natural death, but he was willing to die. He was a martyr in will, not in deed, because he didn't do it, but a martyr in will, which is why on the feast of John the apostle, we bless wine. You bring in your bottles of wine on the feast of John, because remember, 
We heard in the prophecies of Isaiah, in that book of Revelation class, that when the Messiah would come, new wine would flow. And so on the 27th, we bless wine because of the birth of the Messiah and because of John. December 28th is, I think, one of the most powerful days. Boy, did I get those dates wrong in your notes. I apologize. It's like all over the place. It's the 28th of December, the Feast of the Holy Innocents. You know the story from Matthew with Herod and the slaughter of all male children under the age of one in Bethlehem when the Magi showed up. Herod, by the way, I mean, there should be like a mini-series on Herod. I mean, he was a walking soap opera and a walking slime bag. I mean, you want to talk about empire at its finest? Just go read about Herod. I mean, poof. I love this from St. Quod Voltus Deus, early 400s. It's really kind of, t- you really see how empire reared its ugly head at the birth of Jesus. A tiny child is born who is a great king. Wise men are led to him from afar. They come to adore one who lies in a manger and yet reigns in heaven and on earth. When they tell of one who was born a king, Herod is disturbed. Empire is always disturbed. And to save his kingdom, he resolves to kill him. Though if he would have faith in the child, he himself would reign in peace in this life and forever in the life to come. Why are you afraid, Herod, when you hear of the birth of the king? He has not come to drive you out, but to conquer the devil. But because you do not understand this, you are disturbed and enraged. And to destroy one child whom you seek, you show your cruelty in the death of so many children. You are not restrained by the love of weeping mothers or fathers mourning the death of their sons, nor by the cries and the sobs of the children. You destroy those who are a tiny in body because fear is destroying your heart. You imagine that if you accomplish your desire, you can prolong your own life, though you are seeking to kill life himself. Yet your throne is threatened by the source of grace, so small, yet so great, who is lying in the manger. He is using you, all unaware of it, to work out his own purposes, freeing souls from the captivity of the devil. He has taken up the sons of the enemy into the ranks of God's adopted children. The children die for Christ, though they do not know it. The early churches always saw the witnesses of the holy innocents by deed, not by will, but by deed. The parents mourn for the death of martyrs. The child makes of those as yet able to speak fit witnesses to himself. See the kind of kingdom that is his, coming as he did in order to be this kind of king. See how the deliverer is already working deliverance, the savior already working salvation. But you, Herod, don't know this and are disturbed and furious. While you vent your fury against the child, you are already paying him homage and do not know it. How great a gift of grace is here. To what merits of their own do the children owe this kind of victory? They cannot speak, yet they bear witness to Christ. They cannot use their limbs to engage in battle, but yet already they bear the palm of victory. There's that very famous hymn, Lule, Lule, Thou Little Tiny Child, that we always sing on this feast day. You can find that in the Book of Common Prayer, 247. That's just the first three days of Christmas. And then we have nine more. (laughs) December the 28th to January 5th is the 12 days of Christmas. And in the midst of those days is the great feast of the holy name of Jesus, which is January 1st. And that day touches four subjects. It's the octave day of Christmas. The octave day is one of the most powerful days. The first day of the feast always points us to the day of eternity. Why is the eighth day more important? Because on the eighth day, Jesus was circumcised and given a name. Christ came upon earth to redeem us. He could have simply accomplished our redemption in a single word or act, but he desired to carry out his saving missions through a series of actions, crowning it with the supreme work of the Paschal Mystery. And on January 1st, at his circumcision, flows the first drop of the Redeemer's blood. And the eighth day is the day the world hears for the first time the name of our Redeemer, Jesus. The Benedictus Anaphon for this day. Today a wonderful mystery is announced. Something new has taken place. 
God has become a man. He remained what he was, and yet has become what he is not. And though the two natures remain distinct, he is one. Alleluia. We also celebrate the motherhood of Mary on that day. And it is now New Year's Day. And so at the end of those liturgies, we always sing the custom, have the custom of reciting the Te Deum, which is in the book of occasional services, thanking God for the blessings of the past year and asking for his presence in the upcoming year. Christmas is not one day. This is why I always say, don't take your decorations down. Don't throw the tree out because it lasts 12 days. I don't think any of you would go to a wedding and before the bridal party started to dance, you started taking the things off the tables. I mean, some of you may. You take centerpieces and you're out, right? But we have a 12-day wedding feast, and each day shows us in a different way the glory of Christmas. Celebrate the fullness of the 12 days of Christmas, and then come here on Epiphany, at the climax of all of this, to celebrate the great moment of the Lord's manifestation. And that night used to be filled, the 12th night, Shakespeare, right? The twelfth night of Christmas is when people took down their greens and burned them, and there were big bonfires. That's when trees were taken down and all of that stuff, and all of the Epiphany celebrations started, but we're not going to get to that till our, our level class in January. But the twelve days of Christmas give us, like a prism, different understandings of the Incarnation, which really kind of goes for the 40 days until the Feast of Candlemas, but you'll learn about that more in January. I can't believe I did the twelve days of Christmas in like 15 minutes. So we have time for questions. Questions or comments? And this is where I freak Sam out. Sam, I'm going to grab the microphone over here. Oh, good. Questions, comments. And this can be about anything of Christmas tide. Just raise your hand. Eric, wait a minute. Let me come over here. How does your Christmas tree look? How does my Christmas tree look? Subdued. No. <laughs> Decor I, I saw a meme the other day. Decorations in your house for Christmas should look like joy exploded everywhere. It should look like joy exploded everywhere because we are celebrating the incarnation of God. So, yes. That's what, well, I mean, that works too, I guess. What? Oh yeah, my treat. You can ask. Yeah, ask my parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Father Jason, it seems to me that somehow we've been this story for so long. How is it that coming out of now? How should this story should change you? And how, why did it come about now? So Glenn's question, if you didn't hear, was he's a cradle Episcopal, and he's like, this is the first time I'm hearing all this stuff, right? I, I have said it. I will say it until I'm dead. You can put it on my tombstone. We as a church have been suffering, and not just the Episcopal Church, but the Roman Church, the Orthodox Church, across the Church, have been really suffering from a lack of formation. One of the reasons I came up with Alive is to teach the liturgy and the theology of why we do all this, to give formation. You really want me on my soapbox right now? I'll get on my soapbox right now. Seminaries are a barren wasteland. I mean, I've been on commission on ministry in this diocese for years. I am shocked at when people come out ordained how little they know. And that's sad. That's really sad, especially about the liturgy, about the liturgy. But the church, I mean, I, it's not, you know, none, nothing that I just said to you is my own invention. <laughs> the church has been proclaiming this in her, in her collects and in the hymns and the theology for millennia. Millennia. Um, I, I, I quote him a lot. Alexander Schmemann is a liturgical uh, theologian from the Orthodox Church. And he wrote some beautiful stuff. And one of the things that he talks about is we suffer right now for a, from a form of liturgical unconsciousness in the church. And we so don't understand what we pray and the theology of why we're doing it. And when God gives us the grace to unlock it, I mean, you can know that in your own life, when you hear all this stuff, it's exciting. 
it gives life. It starts to make sense. You're moving from liturgical unconsciousness to consciousness. And then God's grace can explode in you all from just praying with the church. Right? So how should this change you? That's why I keep talking about doing Advent differently, doing Christmas differently, breaking from the chains of, well, this is what we've always, I got to buy the presents, I got to buy the, I got to do do all this stuff, tree has got to go away. I mean, I know people who take down their tree on Christmas night. And I'm like, what? (laughs) You want to talk about miss the boat? It's been up since November. You know, and I don't really care when you put up your tree. None of that makes any bit of sense, right? I don't, you want to sing songs about reindeer with nose problems and, you know, frost? I don't, whatever. That has nothing to do with the power of the incarnation. You can sing them in August. Who cares, right? Whatever you want to put up your tree, but celebrate the fullness of Christmas tide and the meanings behind it. So take what you're learning tonight and make changes in your own lives. The small changes are the ways we do that. Pray with the church. Pray with the church. If I haven't mentioned it, pray with the church. Pray more. I'm telling you, when you pray morning prayer during Advent and the 12 days of Christmas, this all makes sense. And if you can't do it live at 9, do it on your lunch break. Pull up the bulletin. Read it whenever. Because when you see the theology of the church, all of this begins to make sense to you because we're praying along with the church. And it helps form us. The liturgy really does help form us. Wow, is right. I remember when I was in seminary for the first time hearing some of this stuff. I was, I was the same way that you were. I was, I was mad. I was like, why has no one taught this? And a lot of times it's because priests don't know it, or they didn't have good formation themselves, or maybe they don't know how to share it. That's why I'm making this a live video, so it can be on for pet, pet two people are watching it all over the country, just to get the, the stuff out, you know? I learned my theology from an amazing Norbertine canon, Father William Fitzgerald, and he learned it from other great priests who've been passing this all down for the centuries. But it's amazing when you come to understand it, how it just enlightens and makes you excited. My dad has his hand up, and that makes me nervous. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> so, to that man's question over there. Glenn. That guy's not, is he? Or, so in other words, Christmas Day is not the biggie we always thought it was? Christmas Day is the biggie. Oh, yes. But we lose the understanding of octaves that the early church had. Octave days, St. Augustine said, are greater days than the first. Even in the Jewish world, you ever hear that passage where it's Hanukkah, and on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus gets up and says it. What does that mean? The first day, Christmas and Easter, are the major days, right? The octave day, day number eight. God created the world in how many days? No. Six, he rested on the seventh, on the Sabbath, and then Jesus rose on the first day of the week, i.e. the eighth. It's the beginning of the new creation. It's a way for us to encounter God permanently in heaven. The eighth day is deeper theology than the first day. Ooh, how about that, right? The first day of Christmas teaches us about the incarnation and how Christ was born. All the stuff that I mentioned earlier. The eighth day... He enters into covenant with us. He is circumcised. He enters into the covenant. It's the first time his blood is shed. It was great that he was born in the manger, but he didn't come just to be born in a manger. He came to save us. And on the eighth day, that act is actually happening, and we're able to call him by a human name. Because remember, in the Jewish world, God's name was never allowed to be uttered. God's name was never allowed to be uttered. It was whispered one day a year on the Day of the Atonement in the Holy of Holies by the High Priest. And he would take the blood of the covenant and he would splash it on the Ark of the Covenant and he would whisper, Yahweh. And if he was unworthy, he would drop dead. So I tell you, when the High Priest would go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, and no one knew if he was purified or not, he went through some mixed bass, but we hope that year he was a good one. But just to be safe, because no one was allowed in the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope on his leg that went out to the temple. Because if they heard a thud, not a good one. And so they would have to drag him out, because no one was allowed in there. Yes. 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 Because he can only whisper the name once. The eighth day of Christmas, you can shout with your own lips, Jesus. And not only 
Is it just the Holy of Holies where the high priest does it? But you get to actually take him on yourself and receive him in the sacraments. All of those high priests, even the ones who dropped dead on the floor, did not see a day as you see the day now. And so that's why the eighth day is way more powerful than the first. Easter, obviously the power of the resurrection is the great day. On the Easter octave is when Jesus appears to them and says, touch my side. Right? Touch my side. The two sacraments of Eucharist and baptism are now given to us where we can enter in to the power of the resurrection. So normally the eighth day is how we enter into the mystery of God. So the first day is important, but the eighth day is how we actually have access to those mysteries. The eighth day of Christmas, we get to call him Jesus. The eighth day of Easter, we get to enter into the resurrection through the waters of baptism and receive the risen Christ in the most holy Eucharist. The eighth day is always the most powerful day, which is weird because there will be packed churches on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and maybe about 15 on, Christ- on New Year's Day. Yeah, but yes, that's St. That's Augustine, and in our Jewish world, first century Jewish world, the eighth day was the greatest day of the feast. Good call. Yeah, so I hope to see you this year, New Year's Day, 10 o'clock. You can watch the Rose Parade later. That's why, that's right, you can, that's, that's everything is, yeah. What else? I wish we had time to go through all the customs of Christmas. (laughs) Because there are many and thick and there are varieties all over the world. Christmas trees really symbolize the eternal life. It once again is the tree of life that's been given to us by Jesus, escorting us back into the Garden of Eden. Um, It's normally originally covered with sugared fruits because humanity was now denied the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now is opened up to us. That's why you have ornaments on your tree. It was to symbolize fruits back in the day. And I think this thing is on. Okay, so presents. Presents! (coughs) So we've talked about, you know, there's this mad dash to, uh, and it it takes up our focus. Mm -hmm. And it's it's empire saying, we've got to give everybody presents, and it's so much about presents, and how many presents, and... What is the connection to Christmas, truly to Christmas with presents? And what, or what should it be? Yeah. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christmas is a gift from the Father. And so the giving of gifts was meant to symbolize God giving us his son. That's originally where they came from, the gift giving and the sharing of gifts. But empire has twisted it right? What? True. It's also the wise men. It's the magi who bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? And so, by the way, in in Mexican Spanish cultures, epiphany is the day that gifts are given and shared because the wise men brought gifts to the Christ child, so that's part of it too. And so we see that gift giving embedded in the Christmas story, but empire has so now twisted it, it really becomes worship. It's the offering of the sacrifice on the cash register, right? And how much, we, how much we physically give to each other is what really our showing our love means. Instead of presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, and giving our time and our love to each other and doing things a little bit differently. But even right now when I say, maybe don't give gifts this year for Christmas, there's part of you that's like, eh, I don't know about that. <laughs> right? How will it look? How will it be? Or maybe if you just narrow it down to one, Right? One. That's even harder. I mean, so there's an inner angst with us. Why? Captive. We're captive to the God of Mammon. The God of Mammon. St. Nicholas. Bling! Whose feast day is Wednesday. All the stockings that are hung on mantelpieces are because St. Nicholas was trying to take care of three young women whose father um, was a widow, he was poor, he couldn't afford, back in those days they couldn't get married unless they had a dowry. Nicholas's family had a lot of money, they left him a lot of money, and so how did he get the gold? Secretly to them, he threw bags of gold in their chimney, which is why Santa comes down the chimney and fills stockings, because it landed near the hearth where their shoes and their stockings were drying, and on the third night of doing that, they ran out and caught him 
Uh, that's how he they actually was calling. But that's how that's all of the stuff around Santa Claus, Santa Nicolas, uh, comes from. So the gift of giving is also about taking care of the poor. Giving gifts is about helping and feeding others and the poor and the homeless. Poor and in a manger. So gift giving is more about feeding those who have less. Whereas what happens in all culture is we just keep giving more and more to all of those who are the fatted calf. Right? Okay. Anything else? <laughs> it's all recorded. Did someone else have their? Yeah. Right, no one will give him medicine or tissues, the poor man. <laughs> all they give him, all they give him is a light bulb. They used to laugh and call him names. Right? <laughs> Anything else? Come celebrate the 12 days of Christmas here. If you notice, we have Mass almost every night and every day of Christmas. And those Christmas week Masses are just with the light of the nativity set and the Christmas lights and the beautiful candles. Have you ever been here for those? They're spectacular, especially the evening masses at 7 o'clock. Uh, there's a whole calendar on the back of your bulletins of all the various liturgies for Christmas. If you can't make it, make one or two, but pray the morning office. They are so beautiful during Christmas tide. They will all be posted on morning prayer. I really encourage you to do that. Father Jason, when you say that, does that mean it's, when you elaborate, that's not, that's live? On the website? So every time we have morning prayer, yeah, go to our website, okay. go to www.allsaintsnewalbany.org, click on the worship button, click on the bulletin button, you will see all the bulletins for the week. Nine o'clock, Monday through fr Thursday is live. Friday and Saturday are pre-recorded, but there's nine o'clock morning prayer six days a week. If you can't watch live, when we're done with it live, it automatically posts to YouTube and you could watch it anytime during the day. Some people listen to it as they drive to work. Some people watch it on their lunch break. Some people don't pray it until they come home for dinner. Great. Who cares when you pray it? There's no time in God. You can pray it wherever you want. Uh, but praying morning prayer or listening to morning prayer or even just reading the third reading will give you a lot of the theology of the season uh, that's embedded in the church's tradition. So there's different ways to do it. All right, everybody. I think that's it for tonight. Thank you all so much. The next live is January, the first Sunday of January, which is January the 7th. January the 7th. Epiphany is the 6th, and we have a huge Epiphany Mass at 5 and party.